Welcome back to Counting to Five, a podcast about the United States Supreme Court. In this episode, we're going to look at two cases from this term, Visa Inc. v. Osborne and Ivy v. Morath, both of which disappeared from the court's docket without oral argument or a written opinion. The court disposed of these two cases in different ways and for very different reasons, but both are interesting for what they show us about the court and the judicial system. The first case is actually a pair of cases, Visa Inc. v. Osborne and Visa Inc. v. Stumbos, that were consolidated for argument at the Supreme Court. Consolidation is when a court takes two or more cases and treats them as effectively a single case. When the Supreme Court has multiple cases before it raising the same legal issue, the court will often consolidate the cases, which means they will be briefed and argued together and will typically be decided with a single opinion. For example, last term, the court heard Zubik v. Burwell, a case challenging the application of the Affordable Care Act's contraceptive mandate to religious nonprofits, but Zubik was actually the consolidation of seven separate cases from various lower courts. In Visa, each of the two consolidated cases was an antitrust action against both Visa and MasterCard, alleging that they had engaged in price-fixing conspiracies in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The lawsuits claimed that Visa and MasterCard had each conspired with their respective member banks to fix ATM fees. The plaintiffs in these cases, called respondents at the Supreme Court, were several individual consumers and independent ATM operators. Osborne and Sumbos were two of the individual consumers. In the lower courts, Visa and MasterCard, I'll refer to them collectively as the networks, made motions to dismiss the cases, arguing that the plaintiffs hadn't adequately alleged a conspiracy. Ultimately, the Court of Appeals ruled against the networks, saying that the allegations in the complaints were good enough to keep the cases alive. The networks petitioned the Supreme Court to hear the cases, and the court agreed. When a losing party wants the Supreme Court to hear its case, it files what's known as a petition for a writ of certiorari, also known as a cert petition for short, and a crucially important part of the cert petition is what's known as the question presented. This is a brief statement of the specific legal issue or issues that the party is asking the court to resolve. When the court agrees to hear a case, also known as granting cert, the question presented identifies the legal question or questions the court intends to answer. If a cert petition contains more than one question presented, the court may not agree to hear all of them, and occasionally the court will modify the question presented or even add additional questions that weren't in the petition. Here, the specific question the networks asked the court to decide was this, whether allegations that members of a business association agreed to adhere to the association's rules and possess governance rights in the association, without more, are sufficient to plead the element of conspiracy in violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. In other words, according to the networks, the key legal issue is whether simply belonging to and participating in a business association can be enough to show the existence of a conspiracy. Here, the business associations at issue were the joint ventures between regional banks that made up the Visa and MasterCard networks. The network's cert petitions argued that by deciding against them, the Court of Appeals had created a circuit split on this issue. A circuit split is when different federal courts of appeals, referred to as the circuit courts, come to conflicting conclusions on a legal issue. The Supreme Court cares a lot about circuit splits. It's arguably the single most important factor in the court's decision to take a case and the court took the Visa case on the understanding that it would be resolving a circuit split on the question presented, whether mere membership in a business association could demonstrate conspiracy. After the court grants cert agreeing to take a case, the parties file their merits briefs. These are their detailed legal arguments for their positions. Here, when the networks filed their opening merits brief, their legal argument seemed quite a bit different from the issue raised in their cert petitions. Rather than focusing on mere membership in a business association, the networks instead argued that the actions of the business associations, that is the joint ventures, shouldn't be attributed to the individual member banks for purposes of finding a conspiracy. In their opposition briefs, respondents called out the networks for changing their argument, saying that the issue they're now pushing is outside the question presented that the court agreed to hear. The federal government also filed an amicus brief in the case, that's a brief from a non-party with an interest in the outcome, and that brief made the same point. The networks responded to this accusation in the reply brief, arguing that their merits brief argument was really a reframing of the same issue raised in the question presented, because the Court of Appeals had attributed the actions of the joint ventures to their member banks by virtue of their mere membership. But the Supreme Court wasn't buying it, and the very next day dismissed the writ of certiorari, saying that, after having persuaded us to grant certiorari on this issue, petitioners chose to rely on a different argument in their merits briefing. The court therefore orders that the writs in these cases be dismissed as improvidently granted. In Supreme Court jargon, this is referred to as a dig, for dismissed as improvidently granted. And when this happens, it's as if the court never agreed to take the case in the first place. Sometimes the court will dig a case if it realizes the case has jurisdictional or procedural complications that it needs to get past to answer the real question of interest, 
But here the court basically digged the case because of what it saw as a bait and switch. So what does this mean for the case? The networks lost their chance to have the cases thrown out for failure to adequately allege a conspiracy, and the cases get to move forward back down at the trial court. The moral of this story is that the Supreme Court really cares about which cases it takes. With very limited exceptions, the court gets to pick and choose which cases it hears, and it is very choosy. In recent years, the court has received in the ballpark of 7,000 cert petitions a year, and grants only around 70. When the court does agree to hear a case, it's not going to be pleased if the case doesn't turn out as advertised. The second case is Ivy v. Marath. This case was on the court's docket at the start of the term and was even on the court's oral argument calendar for the November argument session. But then, in mid-October, only a few weeks before it was due to be argued, the court issued a revised argument calendar without Ivy v. Marath. Then, on October 31st, the court got rid of the case with a one-line order saying, The judgment is vacated and the case is remanded to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit with instructions to dismiss as moot. So what's going on here? Ivy v. Marath was a challenge under the Americans with Disabilities Act to Texas's system of providing driver education classes. In Texas, an under 25-year-old must complete a driver education class before becoming a licensed driver. The state of Texas itself doesn't provide driver education classes, but instead licenses private providers to conduct these classes. The plaintiffs in this case were five hearing-impaired individuals, including Donica Ivy, who alleged that they attempted to take classes with state-licensed driving schools but were refused necessary accommodations like sign language interpreters. They brought suit against the Texas Commissioner of Education alleging a violation of the ADA. The legal issue before the court was whether Texas is responsible for the private state-licensed driving school's failure to comply with the ADA. If Texas were directly providing driver education classes, it would clearly be responsible for any failure to provide appropriate accommodations. But here, Texas argued, it was merely a licensor and it wasn't responsible for the actions of the private driving schools. The plaintiffs argued that because driver education is a state-mandated course with a state-created curriculum, regardless of whether it's provided by private entities, it is still a public program and Texas is responsible for ensuring ADA compliance. In their opening merits brief, the petitioners, the five hearing-impaired plaintiffs below, revealed that their circumstances had changed substantially since the start of the litigation. Four of the five had since managed to complete a driver education class, and the fifth had since moved out of Texas. In light of this, Texas argued that the case was now moot and should be dismissed. The court agreed. So what is mootness? A case is moot when what was once a legitimate controversy between the parties no longer exists. It is closely related to the legal concept of standing, and both standing and mootness are ultimately traced to Article Three of the U.S. Constitution, which establishes the federal judiciary. Under Article Three, the federal courts have jurisdiction over several categories of, quote, cases and controversies. For example, cases arising under the laws of the United States, which includes this action under the Americans with Disabilities Act. The Supreme Court has interpreted the Constitution's references to cases and controversies to mean that the jurisdiction of the courts is limited to actual disputes between parties with a real stake in the outcome. Courts can't hear abstract or hypothetical questions or cases brought by a party without any real interest in the outcome. A party with such an interest has standing to bring the action. Here, the plaintiffs allege that they were harmed by the lack of disability accommodations by driving schools, and a judgment ordering Texas to bring the driver education classes into compliance with the ADA would have directly benefited them, so they had standing. On the other hand, if the suit had instead been brought by non-disabled third parties who were angered by Texas's alleged failure to comply with federal law, they would have had no standing, even if they were seeking the exact same order from the court, because they would not stand to benefit from the relief. Similarly, when plaintiff's circumstances changed so they no longer needed to take the driver education classes, they no longer had a stake in the outcome and the case became moot. Learning this, the Supreme Court sent the case back to the lower court and ordered it dismissed. In the Visa case, the court's dig kicked the case from the Supreme Court, but didn't end the litigation. The Supreme Court won't weigh in on the case, but it continues to go forward in the lower court. In Ivy v. Marath, on the other hand, the dismissal for mootness ends the litigation altogether. Any challenge to Texas's driver education system under the ADA would need to be a brand new action with a new plaintiff withstanding. Another difference is that the visa dig was entirely discretionary, just like the decision to grant a cert petition in the first place. The court wasn't happy with what it saw as a bait and switch, but theoretically, if the court had decided that the issue argued in the network's merit brief was just as important as the original question presented, it could have chosen to keep the case. But because mootness is based on the constitutional case or controversy requirement, dismissal of a moot case is mandatory, unless it fits into one of a few specific exceptions. More on that in a moment. 
I first discussed Ivy v. Marath's potential mootness back in episode 4, before the court actually ordered it dismissed. And after that episode, I got a question from listener and friend of the podcast, Ted. Ted asked, In light of the mootness doctrine, how can a college affirmative action case go forward when the plaintiff has since attended and even graduated from a different school? That's a great question with a few possible answers. One answer is that mootness depends on the type of relief that a party is seeking. In Ivy v. Marath, the plaintiffs were seeking an order forcing Texas to change the way it administers its driver education program. Once the plaintiffs would no longer benefit from the order they're seeking, the case is moot. But another type of relief a plaintiff might seek is money damages for past harms. Changed circumstances going forward don't erase a past injury. In Fisher v. University of Texas, a recent case challenging UT Austin's affirmative action program that made it up to the Supreme Court twice, plaintiff Abigail Fisher sought $100 in damages to cover her college application fee and housing deposit. Despite Fisher's graduation from Louisiana State University during the course of the lawsuit, she still had a live case because of that $100. There are also a few exceptions to the mootness doctrine that may apply in certain cases. One exception is for cases that are capable of repetition yet evading review. These are cases that are difficult or impossible to fully litigate before becoming moot due to the short time frames involved. The best known examples in this category are abortion cases brought by pregnant women. Without this exception, these cases would become moot within at most nine months, leaving no realistic possibility of review by the Supreme Court. This exception has also been applied to certain election cases and short-term contracts, among other areas. Class actions provide another possible way to avoid mootness. If a court certifies a class action, that is, allows a plaintiff to sue not just for him or herself, but also on behalf of other similarly situated persons, and the named plaintiff's claim later becomes moot, as long as there are members of the class whose claims are not moot, a new named plaintiff can be substituted and the case can stay alive. Thanks again to Ted for the question. And that brings us to the end of Episode 6. Links to resources related to this episode can be found in the show notes at countingtofive.com, that's T-O and the number 5, As I mentioned last episode, we've got a lot of ideas for future episodes, but what we actually end up covering is going to be heavily influenced by listener feedback. So please, let us know what you want to hear so we can bring you the Supreme Court content you're looking for. Your questions, suggestions, and requests are all welcome. You can leave a comment on the show notes post at CountingTo5.com or on the Counting to 5 Facebook page. Tweet at Counting to 5 or send an email to Mike at CountingTo5.com. And we have a new feature, the Counting to 5 voicemail line. You can call and leave questions and comments at 774-226-8685, that's 774-2-COUNT-5, and your message may be played in a future episode. I look forward to hearing from you. In our next episode, we're going to briefly review several of the Court's most recent opinions. I hope you'll join me. Thank you for listening. This has been Counting to Five.